Welcome to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. Over the past few months, we've spent a lot of time speaking with guests about sustainability, how we as individuals can make personal choices to live a more sustainable lifestyle. We've explored ways to use renewable energy in our homes. We've looked at the greenhouse gas emissions of different foods and talked about how changing our diets can improve our health and help the planet. We've discussed the advantages of mass transit and the cost effectiveness of electric cars. We've even explored the clothing that we wear, how eliminating fast fashion and replacing petroleum-based fabrics with sustainable ones, sustainable fabrics like linen and organic cotton, how that can actually save us money as it lowers our personal carbon footprint. And these individual actions are so important. We can't change the world until we've changed ourselves. Making sustainable choices in the way we live, eat, dress, and drive, well, it's our first responsibility. And if we want the option to live a healthy life, and if we want to give that option to our children, then we have to make these choices. But what comes next? What happens once we've personally started down a path towards sustainability? How do we encourage others to join us? How do we promote sustainable choices to our communities and beyond? We're joined today on Zoom by Mark Reynolds, Josh Turner, Danella Broad, and Stephen Melton. Mark Reynolds is the executive director of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Mark is a frequent guest on TV and radio shows, has appeared before the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication, and is a prolific writer of op-eds on climate solutions. Hi, Mark. Thank you, Bob. Great to be here. Josh Turner served in the Air Force from 2000 to 2006 and is currently councilman for the 5th District of New Albany, Indiana. Hi, JT. Hey, Bob, how's it going? Danella Broad is the Citizens Climate Lobby's co-coordinator for the state of Oregon. Danella served with Portland Stormwater Management Utility for 17 years, leading their flood management programs and green initiative, green infrastructure initiatives. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Bob, great to be here. Stephen Melton is the leader of Citizens Climate Lobby in Kansas City, Missouri. Stephen was on active duty, uh, active duty. He was active duty US Army officer until 2004, then taught graduate seminars on the causes and impacts of global warming at the US Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Bob, and thank you for inviting me. I'd like for everyone to share a little bit more about yourself and what brought you to climate lobbying. Mark, can we start with you? Sure. Um, nothing normal. <laughs> I, I would say how I got here was reluctantly. Uh, my good friend, Marshall Saunders, had started an organization. He um, kept telling me that he wanted me to come run it. Uh, I couldn't quite get my head around what he was talking about. This was 13 years ago. And finally, it clicked that um, he wanted to work on climate change and Congress at the same time. So I said, Marshall, you didn't pick two of the most screwed up things on the planet, you pick both of them. And he, you think this is gonna work? He goes, oh no, this is gonna be great. So uh, it didn't sound like really a good idea to me, but I did agree to go to the Capitol Hill with them. Uh, we spent a day lobbying and we couldn't have been worse. Um, and so I had done a lot of training with organizations uh, outside of uh, an advocacy role. And I said, why don't we try something different tomorrow? Rather than talking about cap and trade or carbon taxes, why don't we just see if we have anything in common with the people? And um, we had electric meetings the next day. And that kind of like scared me and said, whoa, uh, I might know something that could work here. Um, and so uh, at that point, I realized that I would probably be spending the rest of my life here because there was a big problem. I was starting to get my head around it and that citizens could be the solution to it. Were you always interested in the environment or is that something that kind of came to you with the climate crisis? So I, I was at the original Earth Day, so it was something that was always interesting to me, but as things got worse, the more I tried to ignore it. I can't stand it when you see articles about animals losing habitat, so I never read any of those articles. I just flipped the pages. It was too painful, and so when I started meeting with Marshall, he kept bringing me more literature, and I'd always thought if something was as big as this, the smart, rich, connected kids would fix it, and what I realized is they weren't. Um, that it was really, really big. It was a big problem. And the people who should have been fixing it weren't doing it. And now uh, what led you to become a climate lobbyist? Yeah, I've always been interested in climate and then that disconnect between what the politicians were doing and what the scientists were saying. But it didn't really hit me until um, 
I was a mom of a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. At that point in my life, I was feeling fairly disempowered. I wasn't working in an office as much anymore. So things in my personal life weren't going super great. But then on top of that, um, I had a little extra time. So I was doing even more reading on climate. And then I just kind of got frozen. I was waking up in the middle of the night, deep anxiety. And right around that same time, I was also, I read an email from Dr. James Hansen, and he said in this email, and it came around right at the perfect time, if you do one thing to save all of creation for your children and grandchildren, then join this group. Well, at that point in my life, I was totally about efficiency and doing one thing, and so I joined CCL. So that's kind of my, my story about joining lobbying. Uh, and before that, I mean, you mentioned 17 years working on green infrastructure, flood management. I mean, it sounds like you've had a long career in environmental issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, I grew up in the beautiful state of Oregon, um, always had access to creeks and rivers. One of my earliest memories is before I was 10, I was I loved crawling through culverts, just urban culverts. <laughs> and I have this image seared in my mind of being in the middle of this about 30 foot culvert and i had 15 feet to go and it was dark tunnel but the big bright ball of light ahead of me and it was like this tipping point like am i going to go back or am i going to go forward i was kind of scared but i was pulled forward despite being scared and so um that kind of evolved into later enjoying playing on the Willamette River and going across the river on a sailboat or a canoe with my sister or friends, spending the entire day on the island. And it wasn't any particular animal or plant or sort of that kind of experience that connected me to nature. It was really a sense of freedom and self-determination. When I was out there, I was in charge of my own destiny. And um, that's what nature gave me. And I, I, I don't know, I just always was driven, am driven to connect, to, to protect that and, and to preserve that for my own children. JT, why are climate issues important to you? Oh, uh, you know, I have, same, same with me. I have, a, I have two small children. I have a six-year-old and four-year-old and uh, I got out of the military and I I was trying to find ways that I could still serve. So uh, one, one afternoon, a friend of mine said, you know, you should, you should come check out the Citizens Climate Lobby uh, chapter that we just started. And uh, I went in there and uh, listened to him speak. And the first, uh, the first uh, presentation they had was how to speak to conservatives. And I was like, hey, I'm a conservative. And I was the only conservative in the room. And I was like, let me, uh, let me tell you what, what, what works for me. And uh, we got to a conversation where, you know, we all know that the climate's changing, you know, is it natural or is it man-made? It doesn't matter, but we know this is the top level problem. So how do we get to that solution as a conservative uh, growing up hunting and fishing? I want my uh, son and daughter to grow up at hunt, hunting and fishing and, uh, and, and enjoy it. Um, and then I got into politics and, uh, you know, conservatives have a place at the table, in my opinion. And, you uh, uh, this is this is something that uh, you know that I that I wanted to take on, but I just didn't know the mechanism to to get there. And uh, and just as I've gone through this, I've learned so much more. Uh, Citizens Climate Lobby chapter in Southern Indiana is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, everybody needs to come to the table. Climate's a big table, and we all need to be there. It doesn't matter what's caused it. We need to get there and figure out what we can do about it. Right. Stephen, you, you started teaching about the causes and impacts of global warming in what, 2004? That's before right. most of us were even aware of climate issues. How did you get started so early in the cycle? Well, well I'm, I'm a future-oriented person. By personality type, I'm one of those three or four people who really cares about the future. And, um, and so when I started teaching at the Command and General Staff College after a career as an Army officer, I, I wrote a class called A Forecast of Warfare in 2025 and then moved to 2030 later on. But I wanted to look out 20 years and see what would be the influences on uh, military policy, on national security, international security, and start to get the, the officers' heads in the game about things were changing. You know, things were changing and we needed to start to address the changes. The 
young soldiers and young officers who were bringing in the army at the time, when they became generals, they would be in a future that was 25 years away. And so I wanted to say, we need to start preparing for this. And uh, global warming price, um, was one of the topics we covered. It wasn't the only topic. Uh, we covered technology and other things. But it was clear even then, in 2004, that climate change was going to be a big deal. And it was going to change the way we thought about international relationships. And uh, the military was going to be in the center of, of the change. Um, you know, to echo something said before is when I, <laughs> I'm here for my grandchildren and my grandnieces and nephews, you know, when I, when I was in the military and teaching at the military school, I would avoid politics completely. I mean, the, the military is apolitical and, and rightly so. But as soon as I got out, I decided that I, I wanted to start working on climate. And I was gravitated immediately to Citizens Climate Lobby, an organization I'd never heard before about before. But what I liked about it was they had a policy solution. So it wasn't just a bunch of people sitting around wringing their hands and talking about what other people were doing. We had a solution that we could fight for and we could energize our um, volunteers to do meaningful work to get that solution in place. And so I guess I, I quit being a, a soldier in the U.S. Army and became a soldier in Mark Reynolds' army. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm proud to, <laughs> I, I, I'm proud to be a private in Mark Reynolds' army. Let me just say that. So let's start with a basic question. I mean, a lot of our listeners may not be familiar with lobbying as an activity. Um, so what is lobbying? Can you just explain the basic premise to us? You want to do that, Mark? Sure. I mean, like when everybody thinks about it, it's like nothing worse than that, right? Being a lobbyist is worse than being a used car salesman. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Uh, because people think about it in the traditional model where people are paid to go advocate on behalf of some organization or company. You know, citizen lobbying is citizens just expressing their right to be engaged in their government. You know, maybe it's not enough to pay your taxes and vote to really call yourself a citizen. Maybe you should have a little more skin in the game. And what we just allow people to do is to figure out how they can get appointments with their members of Congress, how they can hold those meetings, how they can be successful in developing long-term relationships. So what you have is a model where there's a partnership between elected officials and citizens. You know, I was in um, Senator McCain's office uh, six years ago, and I was talking to the receptionist waiting for the legislative aid to come out. And I said, um, how's it going to the person at the front desk? And she said, you know, it's not terrible. I've only been here a year so far. I'm not completely cynical yet. <laughs> and so I kind of did one of those, okay, you know, where you want them to say more. And she said, I wish everybody had to answer our phones for an hour. And I thought, wow, war hero. Yeah. That's, that's how we treat our elected officials. And it was like, you know, sure, it's easy to point the finger at, at politicians and say they got problems, but maybe we're crappy citizens. And I think citizen lobbying is just allows us to be more responsible about taking ownership of our government. But I think, I, I think the better people to hear from are the actual people who do it. I mean, I work for Citizens Climate Lobby. You know, I would love to hear from the people who are actually citizen lobbyists. We have several of those there. Josh, you, you're, you're both an elected official, so on the receiving yeah. side, but you know, you, you've also done lobbying. What, what, is, what is lobbying for you? you? You know, it started off before I got elected as me being a citizen lobbyer with Citizens Climate Lobby. And then as I got elected, um, what I found is I am another vehicle to help lobby. Um, in, in Indiana, it's a very conservative state, and I have a very good relationship with all of our uh, congressmen there and our senators. And it's, it's really opened up some doors, I believe, for, for us here. Um, you know, and I think, and this is important for the people to know, if you really wanna lobby at the federal level or any level in the state level, the easiest way to get there is contact your councilman, contact your local elected officials, because that's what we're there for. We are your liaison to everybody else. And, uh, and if you're like me, I'm more than happy to help anybody, anytime. And uh, that's the key is just shoot an email. Um, our numbers are usually listed, send us a text and, and we're easy to work with. And so I've become a, 
um, kind of, like I said, like a vehicle for the rest of uh, our group. And uh, I've introduced them to uh, uh, people on my end of the political spectrum locally. And we're just really, we're starting to grow. And it's the more support you get locally, it, it all goes up. So, so lobbying, the, the very simple level of understanding lobby is just contacting uh, your elected representative or some leader and saying, I'd like to talk to you about an issue that's important to me. It's, it's sharing your story, your ideas, trying to build that relationship. And you know, we talk a lot about these meetings, but don't you also support like, um, I mean, text and letters and even letters to the editor. Isn't that part of your lobbying process? Absolutely. Mark? Yeah, I mean, we, we our volunteers publish between two to 3,000 letters to the editor uh, a year, between five to 600 op-eds, probably be 700 op-eds this year. Uh, we recently had a campaign of reaching out to the Senate to try and encourage them to include a price in the reconciliation process, and over 50,000 people emailed their senators. So uh, yeah, we use social media, we use traditional media, um, it is really about saying something is important to you and then trying to get that message in a clear and coherent way in front of your elected officials. I'd, I'd like to just add on something that Josh said a few minutes ago, if you don't mind also. Sure. Um, so in, in early 1980s, a book came out called Watership Down. It was a story where the characters were rabbits mm -hmm. and the rabbits had a system, the accounting system that went one, two, three, many. That's what one, two, three, and everything passed through was many. Well, Bob Inglis, former Republican member of Congress, who we thought had a really good bill in 2009, better than the bill that was being debated, Waxman Markey, was the keynote speaker at our conference seven years ago. And we have always promoted ourselves as a bipartisan, nonpartisan, you know, attractive to both people from the right and left. Well, so he gave the keynote speaker of the conference and he said, so how many people in this room are conservative? And many people stood up <laughs> at that point. We realized that we needed to get serious, that we couldn't say that, you know, we had a lot of conservatives and only have four people in a room of 500 people stand up. So we've gotten really serious about that. And we've, we've attracted a lot of people who are right of center uh, and tried to make a place that is welcoming to people that are right of center or is left of center to work on climate change. Yeah, Bob, uh, okay. I have, oh. I, I have something to, about, to add about how I see what lobbying is. I mean, the basic form for me is it's bringing your voice to your elected official. And um, and it's for CCL and, and it's doing it in a respectful way. It's doing, And the reason it's doing it in a respectful way is because a respectful way is the way it works. If someone's being yelled at, they're, you're not going to change their mind. I know it doesn't work in my family. And um, so we're trained to um, we're trained to interact with our elected officials in ways that work. And um, I would say it's kind of a gift because this gift doesn't only, you know, produce results with our own elected officials. These are skills that you can take into all of your relationships in your life. Um, I've used this this kind of stuff on my husband. So, um, so um, you're, you're given training. If you're a new lobbyist with us, you're given a small role. And I will never forget the first time I was in a lobby meeting. I was so nervous I was going to be asked something about the policy. And our junior senator, he sat down and I was just on, on the edge of my seat. What, is, what am I going to have to say? And he's basically said, he's like, I want to go around and hear from all of you about why you're, you've come to Washington, D.C. to lobby about Congress. I practically wanted to cry. Like, I knew the answer to that. I was so happy to be asked. And it, it just felt so good. So lobbying is bringing your voice to the issue. And I want to express that this is for everybody. This is for young, we've engaged young people who are in high school. They're, if you're just a regular old suburban mom, if you're a, a retired teacher, if you're not a retired teacher, I mean, this is, this is nothing, you don't have to be a policy person to go and ask for big policy to be, to be passed at the congressional level. Actually, I think Archie touched on the corporate versus citizen lobby. And it seems like we're aware of a lot of rules and you know people getting in trouble for lobbying at the corporate level. What elements of that apply to the citizen? Do any of them apply to the citizen? How is citizen lobbying different from corporate lobbying? 
Yeah, all the lobbying rules all apply to people who are paid. Um, and they actually specifically apply when you are talking about a specific piece of legislation. So all, all those uh, laws are designed around people who are actually paid lobbyists. So citizen lobbying is, you know, you use the word lobbying, um, you know, maybe you could use engagement, maybe you could use education, but the, the, those are all designed to make sure that people are following certain rules when money's involved. So those of us that want to talk to our representative, we don't have to worry about what we say or how we say it. We can no. just show up and and. But you should us. you should worry about what you say and how you say it. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> but you're not going to get in trouble. <laughs> no, you're not. You're not going to get in trouble with the FEC or anything like that. You might get in trouble with your co lobbyists, but. Um... <laughs> JT. Yeah, I, I I have something to add to that. I think when when you have a citizen lobbying, it's uh, genuine and it's honest. Mm. Uh, you have a corporate lobby, uh, and next thing you know, you're getting into cronyism, which which plagues everybody in politics from the top to bottom, no matter who you are. And uh, you know, when a citizen does it, uh, you just know it's it's honest and it's it's good work. So, can you set, can you perhaps share some stories, kind of tell our listeners what it's like to lobby some of your own experience? Steve, do you want to start with something? Well, yeah, I, I would. And, and you know, I think lobbying, I, I know the focus of CCL, appropriately so, is on national level legislation. We need to get national level legislation and, and have it really spread internationally if we're going to have the effect we want. I would also say that, you know, from my time in the infantry, I learned that you surround the objective before you assault it. Okay, so we have a lot of local lobbying that we do. We go talk to the Chamber of Commerce. We go talk to the city councilman. I talk to the Mid-American Council. We go talk you know, to the various political clubs. We go talk to the, to the county supervisors. We talk to the Girl Scouts. We show up at every kind of rally and pass out our boat climate for the children stickers and talk to them about carbon fee and dividend. You've got to do all that because if you aren't talking engaging the community and getting their support, then you're very you're not likely to get support when you go to the highest political levels. So I always think of it as a giant referendum. <laughs> you know, the people are going to have to want this and the people are going to have to sustain it. And if you keep it private or just, a, you know, between you and your representative in Congress, you aren't really going to gain much traction. I think popularizing the cause, as Mark said, the op-eds, all the things that we do have, are, are beginning to, to reflect at the national level and they're beginning to see that there are a lot of people who really want this and who aren't gonna let it go. And I think that that's an incredibly important part of the lobbying that we do. So you're not just lobbying your, your federal representatives, but also state and local. Oh, yes. Uh, we got to get the word out. The, and, and the message is the same. I, I mean, we, we ask for their support, but really the, the main message that we've selected is that carbon pricing is going to come and you better get ready for it. And, and that is the message. And they take that out. The business people listen to it and they take it out and say, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? And, and the, the more that people reduce their carbon footprints, because of that message, the less afraid they are of the legislation when it actually happens. You, you've got to do the psychological preparation of, of, uh, of, of the citizenry. I think there's something really important in what Stephen's saying about local support. So it's 2021 right now. The last time the US got close to federal legislation on climate change was in 2009. So these windows don't come along very often. When we failed to get something done in the Senate after the House passed Waxman Markey in 2009, there was a political scientist at Harvard who wrote over a hundred page criticism of what happened. Her name is Theda Scotchbull. And what she said was the reason we failed in 2009 because the only support for the legislation was in the beltway and it needed to be back home in the district. So I think what Stephen is saying is absolutely essential. What we need is communities that will say, we're in favor of this. So that if your member of Congress is ready to make a courageous vote, there's a number of avenues and communities. Bob mentioned business. It could be, I love the Girl Scouts. You know, the, <laughs> the Girl Scouts are for this. But that we want, to, we want elect officials to know that in their hometown, they're going to be supported for doing, taking courageous action. Right. 
You're listening to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. We're speaking with Mark Reynolds, Josh Turner, Danella Broad, and Stephen Melton about lobbying for climate solutions. JT, you're an elected official. I mean, you've obviously lobbied other officials, but you are an elected official. Tell us what the citizens' lobby looks like from that side. From from that side, I mean, they they are very respectful. Uh, they they don't put a t- ton of pressure on you, uh, but they are very welcoming to all of our elected officials, not just myself, but all the way up to the federal level. Uh, there's just, a, they, they build a good relationship with our elected officials. And I think that's just the way you have to get things done. You take that time, you build those relationships and uh, it, the way you speak and, and, and you're not very aggressive, but you're just planting seeds and you're, you're gaining some ground where you can. And um, I even, through, through my work with Citizens Climate Lobby to kind of go back to the local, I created a, uh, I, I attempted to create a commission, uh, a sustainability commission in New Albany, Indiana, uh, that was, that involved all citizens, no politics in it, not funded by tax dollars. Uh, and unfortunately it didn't pass as hard as we tried, but uh, it was a start and it had a lot of support from the people. So I, I it's just uh, the work that they've done is, uh, it just starts at the bottom level and it works all the way up. So as an elected official, do you like to be lobbied? How, how, what's your reaction when you get that phone call from a, you know, one, one of your constituents and they say, hi, JT, I need to come talk to you. What's your reaction? Well, well first my ego gets fed and uh, every <laughs> <laughs> politician has an ego. Uh, no, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it makes me feel like I have my purpose. You know, it, it's, it tells me that I'm doing a good job that they come to me uh, and they choose to speak to me over all the other ones that are, that are in my district. And uh, it, it's just, I want to, I'm here to help. And, uh, and I truly believe it in my heart uh, and it's, and it is service. And uh, no, there's nothing better than, than seeing something start at the ground floor and grow into something and see these relationships um, grow into something. I mean, even in Indiana, I mean, we have Senator Braun. I mean, he is, he is leading the charge in Indiana with these, with these types of issues. And, uh, you know, it, I don't think that would happen without the citizens climate lobby and, and other people that are lobbying uh, all the time. I mean, this is, I, I truly feel that Indiana uh, is really leading the way in some aspects. Danella, you're obviously working the, the state of Oregon. Um, do you have some stories? Can you tell us what it's like to lobby at that state level? Yeah, so we did some work that uh, uh, Stephen alluded to, some of that um, building up that psychological readiness at the local level. We started lobbying our state legislators to support a state resolution that was in support of federal carbon fee and dividend legislation. So we very intentionally talked to all of our state legislators, our Democrats and our Republicans. And um, we knew that that was important because we wanted them to give the backing to our congressional reps, know that the congressional reps had their, the state reps had their, the congressional reps back. And we did, we had, I think it's easier for people to feel comfortable reaching out to their local reps. It was an easier, more comfortable, relaxed conversation, just lower pressure. So that was an entry point for a lot of our volunteers to just talk to their state reps about this resolution. We had some great successes. It got to the Senate, the Oregon Senate, and it passed with 100% of the Democrats and 60% of the Republicans in support of this carbon fee and dividend um uh legislation so that was super exciting um we thought we'd have a harder time with the republicans but they seemed to like it uh, my favorite quote from uh, a republican that we talked to was uh when she said it's time for congress to stop playing small ball on climate so we were just blown away by the engagement of the republicans um but overall, the story in Oregon after all that was it didn't get it didn't uh, pass through committee. It was, it, time ran out before we were able to get it to the House floor for a vote. But in the end, we know that a broad spectrum of Oregon Democratic legislators, including moderates and progressives, plus a substantial number of Republicans, support carbon fee and dividend at the federal level. So um, we're building that sort of um, backing for when Congress is ready to make a decision publicly on on this sort of legislation. 
I um, mean, it was real exciting. We didn't think we'd get as far as we did with with the Republicans while also bringing along basically all the of the uh, Democrats. Uh, for those of you that have done um, different types of lobbying in different industries, whatever, is, is climate lobbying different? I mean, is there something, anything unique about climate lobbying or does these same skills apply to, to all the different aspects? Such a good Steve. question. Yeah, go ahead, oh. Stephen. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Throw me out there. Yeah, well, you know, I, so many lessons in life that you learn in one career, one aspect of a career can be used, um, you know, in, in, in other endeavors. I, I, I think one, the big difference is that we aren't really asking for anything for ourselves. You know, we are not. I'm not going in there asking them to support my business. I'm not asking anybody to raise taxes on somebody and give it to me. I'm not asking for some special carve out. All I'm asking for is for my grandchildren to live on a planet that's as healthy as the one that I lived on. That's all I'm asking for. And I think that everybody can take that kind of central goodness and respond to it. I, I, I would hope. And, and I think that that message gets through. I, I would hope it does. Um, um, but th that's the big difference. We, we aren't asking for anything for ourselves. You know, as volunteers, you know, we spend a lot of time, energy, uh, embarrassment, <laughs> you know, doing what we do. And, and we do it for completely altruistic purposes. There's, there's nothing that we're doing here for ourselves. And so I think that that, that's a big difference between us and other lobby lobbyists. Sure. Um, today's age, I mean, with COVID and the pandemic and such, I assume that your your lobbying techniques have probably shifted more virtual, like here we are on Zoom. So is is I mean, we're we're moving to this online environment so that we talk to our representatives virtually instead of the face to face. D do you find that is different? Is what are the pros and cons of, of this, this virtual connection? Who wants to address that, Mark? I'll, I'll go over some of the pros. Um, yeah. You know, typically what we would do is we would have some lobbying that was in district, but then when we would go to Washington DC twice a year, once in June and once in November. So a lot of our lobbying was on the Hill. Uh, there's a lot of people who couldn't come to DC and there's a lot of people who want to be involved in the process, but weren't going to come to our conference. So, for instance, we've been able to, you know, have meetings with senators that used to be 10 people that were 200. Uh, we've had meetings where we were able to include clergy, uh, where we were able to include business leaders who otherwise would not come to D.C. with us. So there's definitely been some upside of, you know, being able to include more people and people who ordinarily couldn't come. One of the really interesting things in citizens lobby is how much the dynamic changes when young people are in lobby meetings. And it's just easier if they can do that virtually rather than having to come to DC. So there's definitely been some upside. JT? Well, that, just to have an instant access really, the, the logistics, it takes away that, that, that problem if you have a Zoom. But you know, the, the real con I think is, and it, and it happens with our meetings, we're still in our city council meetings, we're still on Zoom. I miss that nonverbal communication. I, I, I like to see if what I say is a hit or a miss without them telling me. And you don't get that from Zoom all the time. And uh, that's that's the, really the biggest con of this digital world that we're living in right now. So pros and cons. And, and one takeaway I heard here, which I, I think we understand, but I want our listeners to understand when we're lobbying a representative, that's usually a group of people. You're not going one-on-one, -on -one, although you can. But you know, I, I think when we put together a meeting with a representative, in my experience, when I've gone someplace to lobby, there's usually half a dozen, if not more of us, coming into the room to share our stories. The weight of that meeting is not on one person. It's shared by a bunch of constituents, which makes it easier. And as Mark was saying, if, if it's, you know, in this, this virtual world, how easy is it to, you know, turn on your computer and here we are. So, you know, I would, I would think lobbying is, is as easy as it's ever going to be right now. So if, if, you know, if any of our listeners want to start, now's the time to start. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the, um, carbon pricing, and, and that is CCL's primary focus right now. Um, why carbon pricing? Why is that your focus, Mark? 
Uh, because while there are a lot of things that have to happen to make sure that we can hand off a world to Stephen's grandchildren that he grew up in, the most important is carbon pricing. What almost every economist you'll talk to in the world say, if you want less of something and you want less of something quickly, make it more expensive. So we, uh, there's a lot of things that other people are working on, which is great. We're tackling simply the biggest part of the problem and focusing on that because, you know, what we're trying to do is not trivial. We're trying to not only convince a bunch of Republicans to vote for a new tax, we're trying to convince them to vote for a carbon tax. So we have been a very, very focused organization on that. You know, um, over half of Americans used to smoke. By 2050, there won't be any American smokers because we've made it so expensive that young people can't buy cigarettes for the most part now. It's a really good example of pricing something out of the market. And what we simply want to do is make the burning of coal, natural gas, oil uh, cost what it actually costs to society because they are way underpriced uh, for what the, the impacts that it's having on the planet, planet. So we're simply taking the economist's advice. We're taking the advice of the best scientists in the world, the IPC scientists, saying that what you've got to do is price carbon. Our preferred model for that is what we call fee and dividend where what you do is put a steadily rising price on fossil fuel that, that gets burned in the economy, but then you rebate all of that to households. And we think there's a lot of good reasons to do that. One is we think it's easier to get conservative support because you're not picking winners and losers. You're letting the market drive change. And also because for most households, it'll mean the increase in cost won't hurt them. And we just really think it'll be hard for the American support book to can maintain support if their costs go up and there's not some way of mitigating it. Steve, talk about that some more. I mean, the whole- um, Yeah, no, it's, well, Mark said it so well, it bears repeating, uh, but, but the message is very simple. If you want, you've got to raise the price on fossil fuels to get people to start considering alternatives from an economic standpoint. And, you know, that, that's clear. It's also clear that you need to rebate the money to the American people. All of our experience with this worldwide with carbon pricing in general is that if, if you don't rebate the money to the people, all they notice is their prices going up, uh, everybody's, all these people are voters. And what they're gonna do is the next election, they're gonna vote for the party who says, I'm gonna get rid of the carbon fees. The way you solve that problem is you rebate all the money to the people and just let the market itself begin to get rid of fossil fuels because they're more expensive than the alternatives. It's, it's a win-win situation. <clears throat> um, it's, it's great to see that the legislation is proceeding in the US Congress. I read in the Wall Street or in the New York Times this morning that the um, uh, Progressive Policy Institute published a paper yesterday um, on the reconciliation reality, the new reduction in the reconciliation targets, and again reiterated its support for carbon fee and dividend, and said that you know we need to make sure that dividends go to the bottom one third and middle third of the American economic spectrum so that they aren't harmed by the carbon fees. But you know. In, in Washington, they're looking at very serious legislation. They are writing the language for the legislation right now that, that would get carbon fee and dividend enacted as the law of the land. We have an opportunity right now and we need to seize that opportunity. It is the single most important thing we can do to stop climate change, says the economic community, says the scientific community. It's what we need to do and we need to seize the opportunity. So, so where exactly are we on federal legislation right now? Is it, I mean, is it in committee? Are they still writing it? Has there been votes? Where are we? Where we are is in the reconciliation process. And while we have worked as a bipartisan organization trying to promote bipartisan legislation, reconciliation is a very partisan process. So at this point, it's uh, about making sure that uh, what got floated from Senate finance uh, a few weeks ago was a carbon price being part of the reconciliation package? Uh, so we should see something. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be delayed a little bit because the debt ceiling is going to slow things down a little bit. But sometime in the next couple of months, we should see the reconciliation package. Uh, we'll see what the carbon price looks like. Uh, we suspect uh, that we won't see one in the House, but we will see one in the Senate. 
uh, and that we'll need to work to make sure that that uh, whatever price point they start with is going to be improved upon. Is carbon pricing just a federal issue or do we also need states to enact legislation or, or Danella, you mentioned that you got the state of Oregon to make a statement, a position statement on that. What do we need to do with our state governments? Um, I would say there's a lot of complementary policies that probably um, would fit real nicely in the states. Um, but uh, I, I tend to, I, my personal belief is to emphasize carbon pricing at the national level because you don't have those cross boundary issues between the states. Um, but all the other policies that we need to prepare ourselves and get through this transition could happen at the state level and be more um, appropriate for local conditions. I wanted to I wanted to also take opportunity to respectfully disagree with Stephen that we are all doing this <laughs> lobbying as altruistic, um, completely altruistic um, <clears throat> angel type people. I um, I feel that for me myself, and I also believe that there's a lot most people out there deep in their bones feel that there's something wrong with the climate that the storms and the droughts and the fires, even though they're not thinking about climate change in the forefront of their minds, there is something deeply wrong going on. Mm -hmm. And when we don't take action that feels big, big enough for the problem, that it creates a real deep dissonance and lack of comfort and bad feeling that's essentially bad for our bodies and souls. And so I would gesture to say as bold of a statement that, you know, lobbying, I do it for my own health. Mm -hmm. I do it so I can live um, and, and, and not feel bad deep down and to be able to operate in my other parts of my life. So um, I would respectfully disagree with Stephen. This is completely altruistic. I just want to feel better about what I'm doing. So. A fair comment, <laughs> a fair comment. <laughs> JT, as, as a conservative, what is it about carbon pricing that appeals to you and might speak to other conservatives? Yeah, and I'd like to take this, this moment to, to, to speak to the conservative people that are probably on the fence. Um, you know, we could, we could have the government come in and ban and, and take control of this, this topic. And I don't like to really say as raising carbon prices, but creating a, a market for carbon. Uh, and what that does from a conservative aspect, you know, when you, when you create a market for something, that leads to innovation because of, of the cost the market grows. The free market can handle this. We have a mechanism. We don't need the government to ban things and control what's, what's coming in and out. But if you can create that carbon market, then people will begin to change to save money and build better processes. Um, and if you are a conservative, and you want to get some more information. The one thing that changed my mind, because when I when I heard about the, the carbon dividend, I was no, a fee, absolutely not. We can't handle another fee. This is this is tax. You should listen to Milton Friedman talk about it in the '90s. Um, you know he he he's one of the most conservative people around, the economist, Nobel laureate, and he really went for a uh, carbon pricing back in early '90s, and basically, you know, you. Free market works, you have one-to-one -one transaction between people, but if you have a cost to the third person that you don't know about, then, then that's not fair. Well, there is, a, there is a cost to that third party, and that's all of us, uh, the, the people that have carbon on their shirts. They have to pay for a new shirt. That's his, that, that was his uh, excuse. Uh, asthmatics, I'm an asthmatic. That's a cost to us. Uh, and, and it's time that you know, we create a market around that and let it guide itself. Uh, so if you are a conservative, give this a chance to look into it. Do not get the knee-jerk reaction that I did saying this is just another tax because uh, it's, it's, it's not. Uh, free market, this is a great way to use the free market, which we all believe in from my end. So is, are other countries working on carbon pricing legislation or is this strictly an American thing? No, there's more countries that have a carbon price than don't that are, that are what the World Bank would call developed economies. So uh, European Union's had a program for quite uh, a bit of time and some of the countries inside the European Union have additional prices on top of that. So in terms of developed economies, we're more of an outlier and not having a economy-wide carbon price. So we're playing catch up. A lot of the other countries have already done this and it's working there. 
Um, you know, we would like everybody's price to be higher. Uh, one of the things that we're excited about is the European Union is going to employ a border carbon adjustment in 2023. That's part of the carbon fee and dividend is you put a fee on carbon-based fuels, you rebate all the money back to households, and then you make an adjustment for the border if other countries don't have as severe as carbon fee as we do. Uh, Canada is talking about doing one. We hope so. It makes it a lot easier for the U.S. to do so if they see that, that the pressure is going to come from the European Union and Canada. Uh, Canada's policy is actually kind of a pretty good role model at this point. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there is, in addition to carbon fee and dividend legislation that's in the Congress right now, there's also border adjustment legislation. And, uh, you know, it's um, nobody actually wants to enforce a border adjustment. What they want to do is just give the incentive for any countries that don't have effective carbon pricing to make sure that they do. Right. See. And, and I think that this is going to be a huge issue in the November Glasgow summit when they talk about climate. I, one of the things on the agenda there is going to be to talk about how to make the carbon pricing fair internationally, which is exactly what we need to do. I mean, because it's an international problem. It isn't limited to U.S. borders. So let's talk specifically about citizens climate lobby. I mean, there's a lot of groups out there lobbying, and, you know, a lot of environmental issues people are working on. Citizens climate lobby, it kind of coalesced around this, this one legislation or are there other topics that you support? So it didn't, it didn't coalesce around a piece of legislation. How it actually started is our founder, Marshall Saunders, for 20 years had been working with an organization called Results. Results is an anti-poverty organization. And what, um, what Results proved was that if you organize people by congressional district, so your member had to basically see you, if you spend a lot of time training people and then had a good support structure, you could get Congress to do really interesting things. So 35 years ago, results started asking Congress to increase their appropriation for dealing with extreme poverty, and it's gone up dramatically years after years because of results work. What our founder Marshall said is the climate needs that same type of grassroots organization. So it was more started as an organization that was about building grassroots support for action on climate. That was really the starting point. Uh, and actually, initially, we were supportive of the Waxman Market Cap and Trade Bill. And one day, a gentleman named Tom Starks pulled Marshall aside and he said, there's a simpler, more elegant, more transparent solution. Marshall is one of the most pragmatic people I've ever met. It was something that simple was in front of me. He's like, I get it. Let's do it. We lost half our membership the day that we announced we were switching away from cap and trade because that was, okay, let me just say that was from 24 to 12 volunteers at that point. So it wasn't like this huge <laughs> dramatic loss. <laughs> but but uh, we, we found something that was so simple that not only, you know, I remember talking to George Schultz, who used to be on our advisory board, who said, when a problem's this big, you always do the most transparent, hardest to rig solution, which is what carbon fee and dividend is. But the thing where we got really lucky, it was also something everybody could explain. What drove Marshall crazy about cap and trade is he couldn't find anybody, including the people who wrote the bill, that could explain it to him in a way that he could understand it. So we got lucky in that we found a solution that was incredibly efficient, but also something where thousands of volunteers could go around and, and explain to people. So I'm hearing you say CCL is kind of focused on, on training these citizen lobbyists, uh, providing them resources and helping them engage on, on cap and trade in this case, not cap and trade, but you know, carbon pricing. Mm -hmm. um, how, how big is your group now? I mean, how many volunteers do you have nationwide? Um, it's, it's hard to know that for sure. There's around 200,000 people that have gone to our website and identified them as supporters. We try different ways to measure how many of them are engaged. So, you know, how many of them send something in saying they met with a member of Congress or submitted a letter to the editor, how many people engage on our training platform, which is called CCL University or CCL Community on a regular basis. We estimate that about 15% of the people are active. They're doing, they did something last month, they'll do something this month. So that would put it at about 30,000 people who are actively working on a regular basis. We did establish a third organization this year called Citizens Climate International because we are in 80 countries outside the US. So we're working to build support for that organization also. But a lot of our work is really about making sure the volunteers are trained and equipped with what they need to be successful with their government. Mm -hmm. So what kind of volunteers do you, do you, are you looking for? Are there different jobs, different slots they can fill in? Yeah. 
Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, we've got people who sign up for a writer's team. So once every couple of weeks, they get together on Zoom and they learn how to write letters to editor. They use some of the templates that CCL gives us and submit op-eds, template, uh, uh, they take the templates and t turn them into actual op-eds for our papers. And you, you know, people are thrilled then to see themselves um, in print. So there's writing, um, of course, there's the lobbying that happens between two and four times a year. Um, back, you know, now that we're still kind of in COVID, we did used to ha do more tabling. We go to fairs, farmers markets. Um, so that's an easy introduction, sort of volunteer kind of job where you stand behind a table and answer questions and hand out flyers. Um, and then of course there's the grass tops outreach. Like if you know a business person or if you, if your neighbor is a councilman, you know, you can jump right in and start learning how to have a conversation with them about CCL and the policy. Um, there's a whole range. The, the biggest challenge I think sometimes is for people to find what really fits for them, because this is a, this is kind of a long sprint. It's a, it, it's not just a one-off one-off thing. So finding that thing that fits with what you like to do and how you like to do work. Do you like to work by yourself? Do you like to work in groups? We try to accommodate that. That's really great. So if people want to learn more about what you're doing, um, how can they reach you, JT? Uh, you can reach me at uh, jtfornewalbany.com. And I would also like to mention, uh, we do have a Facebook page, Citizens Climate Lobby of Southern Indiana. Uh, I'd love for people to look and see what we're doing there. Stephen, where can people learn more about the Kansas City chapter of CCL? Well, I, I would recommend people go directly to the national website that Mark and his folks have put together because it's outstanding. It's citizensclimatelobby.org. One word, citizensclimatelobby.org. And there they can learn all about Citizens Climate Lobby. They can join the local chapter wherever they are in the country. They can learn how to send an email to President Biden about the reconciliation bill. They can learn how to email their Congress people and their senators. Everything is on that, on that one page. And they can learn a lot more by going to some of the pages behind it. It's citizensclimatelobby.org. It should be on your bookmark. It's, it's one-stop shopping for what to do about climate change. Danilo, where would you send people? I would say the same thing as Stephen, start at go. the national <laughs> and then you can click on whatever state and then you'll find a chapter that's close to you. And then by clicking on and joining, what will happen is you'll be added to the roster or the mailing list for your local group leader and you'll start getting emails for um, the chapters each have monthly meetings. And then from there, you can get into the action teams. But start at the at the national site and find your state and then the local chapter closest to you. Mark, is there anything you want to add to that? Exactly what they said. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you to our listeners. This is the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove.